I would like to first uh, thank the Hague Talk uh, to give me an opportunity to share with you my practical life experience and uh, how uh, I became the executive director or how I'm standing in front of you. It is very easy when you see me talking like this, but I had and I have many, many challenges. And the good thing is that I'm always ready to face the challenges. Sometimes I'm frustrated, I'm tired, but then I think that I have to solve my problem myself. Definitely with those who are around me, those who support me, and those who believe in my power. So I would like to thank the Hague Talk. I would like to thank all of you to come here and give me more of your young energy because I'm getting old now. So I really need your energy. I really need your energy because I have high hopes for you. I have high hopes for my children to really think of the world as their house. Think of the world as their home, not house. Not just with buildings, not just with stones, not just with wood, but a home with feeling, a home where we care for each other. So I would like all of you to think, to think of a, a, a very old car uh, driving on the road and a little five-year-old girl sitting there with his mothers and two brothers and father, and she doesn't know where she is going. So I, re I remember that like a foggy day like a foggy day, like it's not, it's very unclear. So afterwards, what happens then, I remember that I was in one school, then I was shifted to another school, and then I was shifted to another school. <coughs> so imagine, can anyone tell me which time I'm talking about? A quick guess? No? Maybe my friend Wajma can tell me. <laughs> yes? It must be during the Taliban, before that. No. It was the time when we emigrated to Pakistan. I was five years old when we emigrated to Pakistan. I even didn't know what is emigration, where are we going, why are we going, and what will we do. The reason that I told you that we have always challenges, there had been many challenges. And that was the time when my life started. I never knew vision. I never knew what I would become. We were all the time in struggle to just do something. The only thing which I remember is all the time the support within our family, the support which I consider even today the support of the community. You are my community, and this is an energy. So the, from that time, I have seen that support. And the reason that I have seen that support is, I think, that we all the time have to think positive. We all the time, when we face something, we have to really take, don't first jump at negative, that this bad thing will happen. We all the time have to welcome good things. If you think positive, positive things will come. So in five years after that, I, I went to a school. On that time, there were no schools for uh, Afghan refugees in Pakistan. How I went, what challenges I faced, how I was treated, as I'm sure that there must be immigrants in here. Are there any immigrants? Immigrants? OK. OK. And I want you not to feel the feeling that I had. It was not a good feeling. I would all the time take very high marks, but I would never take the first position because I was not a national of that country. And that never disheartened me because I had a vision in my heart that I will go to my country and work in my country. And today, I am very proud that with that second high marks and second position, today I am working for my country. So that is the approach which I took from childhood. The same thing when I went to the other school, there were many problems for, for the girls and for, for women, refugees there. 
I never knew that they had they would face such problems because in my house all the time we were thinking about education we were thinking about how we can get somewhere so I I went to school but the only thing which we all the time see saw the emphasis was to get education and to earn something yourself to depend on yourself and this is why when I agree with the quote, the men of quality are not afraid of equality. Because I always had the support of my father, I always had the support of my brothers, and today I always have the support of my husband. So that is why struggling towards the school and uh, meanwhile trying to, to be something. Like there were ma many cousins, there were many people within our big family who were studying and after the school they would go, they would have fun, they would go shopping here and there, but we really wanted to do something. So joining different courses, studying, trying to do part-time jobs, that was the struggle. So all the time, like on that time we really didn't, the whole sisters and brothers, the whole family, like we would all the time sit and we would say why can't we all the time have these after school luxuries and these things, why? But today, the, when I see this, I'm thinking, no, that was the right decision. Because if we spend our time on that time, today we could not be a development actor of our nation, which is very, very much needed. So the same thing for you. What we do is from a very young age, you specify what you want to do. Do you want to do it individually? Do you want to do it as a group? What is your specific vision? What do you want to do? What do you want to give, give to those who are around you? If it's your family, if it is your friends, if it's your classmates, if it is your lecturers, whoever, whoever they are, you set your vision and once you give to people, you have so much to collect that you can't even like, you will be full of love, full of care, full of whatever you need. So we really have to have a specific vision. We really have to be always ready. Don't think about that this is a small thing. What will the other person do? What you think is very small, maybe the person who is in front of you might think that that is very, very big. For instance, I get frustrated. On that time, I don't need hundreds and thousands of dollars. I don't need, for example, uh, an LCD TV. I don't need a car with a driver. I would just need my friend who would be sitting with me and she would listen to me and she would say, no, Hasina, I'm here. Tell me what you, what you need. We can do it together. We can overcome the problem. So all of us have problems. All of us have challenges. The only thing which we need to do is to really be firm, fight for it and face the challenges. To relate what I said to the Hague talk is that my childhood had been in, an, uh, in a life which had been a struggle to peace. So it had ups and downs, it had challenges, it did not have that much justice that we are now writing so beautifully in here, peace and justice. It looks very, very, very beautiful. But I think it's very, very complicated. It is very unmeasurable. But the only thing which we can really see the result and we can really see is when we present models. When we really see how. For example, the times, those, I will say that one of the reasons that with all the hardships and all the uh, challenges I had, I will still today say that I am talking this way, I am trying to be a mediator, I am trying to bring in peace within conflict, is that from the beginning I had been treated with peace. I have talked about peace. Not about peace, that what is peace? What does peace mean? When I am sitting, I, I share. When I am sitting, I care. When I am sitting, I listen to you. When I am sitting, I want you to listen to me. When you have a problem, I want to solve the problem with you. When I have a problem, I want you to solve my problem. 
So that, that is a concept which, from the beginning, if we try to inject within our coming generations, and I think you are the coming generation, you can be agents of change, and you can, can really bring change, and you can really bring, uh, bring a change within the community you are. You are also very lucky because this situation which you have, we did not have. We couldn't even have a time to go and sit. We did not have even libraries in our schools. Our schools were tents. Do you know what is the meaning of tent? Mm -hmm. Does anyone know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who can tell me what is a tent? It's the same. Yes? Um, it's the same word in Dutch. It's, uh, you mean just like a tent with uh, It's a piece of cloth. Yes. Okay? It's a big, thick, thick piece of cloth. And it has, it is made by uh, thread, big threads. Because on that time, there were many refugees. And suddenly, like in, in Pakistan, they were not ready to have building schools. So there were some United Nations or some charity organizations, since they saw there were a lot of people coming, they made tents for, for girls. We never had, for example, ACs. We never had these mineral waters. They, they, we really had these hardships. But we overcome it. And today we have a lot of, so many of us. It's not only me standing here. There are hundreds and hundreds of us. In Afghanistan, if you see, all of you know what, how the situation of Afghanistan is. But it is the youth, the young girls, the young boys, who are trying to hold on to all the 13 years which we had the opportunities. They had not been very successful opportunities. But we are trying to make it successful. And we are really trying to make it work. So from from the perspective of peace and justice, if we go back to that, the same thing will bring us. If it was a tent, it was peaceful. So the atmosphere itself affects on how a peaceful atmosphere brings in peaceful personalities. Have you any time tried to find out why do people suddenly get uh, aggressive? Have you any time tried to know why? What is the reason? If you really talk to that person, just, just do it. Just if you see someone talking, being aggressive, just after 5 or 15 minutes, go and talk. Slowly and slowly when you talk and talk, finally you will figure out. Either someone within their family is very aggressive, either on that time that person had been humiliated by someone, or either there is another frustration. So how can we try to cope that is by talking, by healing, by giving that person an opportunity to really take it out, how you take it out. Do you think I am the way I'm talking today, I was like this? No, never. I remember the first time I was giving an interview for my, one of my jobs. I was afraid. I was saying, what kind of questions? Because it's an interview. So how will I go? When I was going, I was shivering. For the first time, when I went and I sat with my boss, my boss asked me a question I could never ask. I could never answer that. But today, if I sit with my president, if I sit with your president, if I sit with the United Nations president, I can talk. I can analyze things. How did it come? It came into being because I believed in myself. Even if no one believed, I thought I could do it. And I really tried to prove that I could do it. So all of you can do it. I think... You have one more minute. <laughs> one more minute. In one more minute, I would like to just request you three things. Commit yourself as an agent of peace from today. Have a clear vision for the coming Hague talk to present an example of how did you become an agent of change. And third thing, commit with yourself that you will give this commitment at least to one person who is younger than you. Thank you very much.
the hate, first of all, I really, I love the fact that you are so young and wonderful and like my colleague, the energy is fantastic. So I really appreciate you coming and honoring us with your presence, thank you. And I, of course, thank the hate talks and looking down because I have to make sure. Thing. So thank you so much, I really appreciate that. And um, you know, they said, we said, how should we prepare? And it was a last minute thing and they said, just bring your heart, speak from your heart. And so that was great. We were not supposed to prepare anything. And then of course, I mean, God forbid, I'm not going to comment because how do you, I, I was supposed to comment what uh, my friend is speaking, but how do you comment when somebody is speaking from the heart? I related to everything that she was saying. It's pure and beautiful. And there's nothing to comment, but only just to congratulate her with a great woman. But two things I would like to say though. This is what a leader looks like from that region. And that, this is really what kills the stereotype. Everything you read, everything you see, everything that you have heard about women, who are wearing their beautiful scarves, live in Afghanistan or any Arab region or any, you know, uh, you know, of the countries in the Middle East. I wouldn't say just Muslim. I'm sure you guys are expecting as a Muslim woman, no? Because many different people live and the culture expands beyond Islam. Many women you'll see wearing are not necessarily Muslim. So um, that, uh, this is what a leader looks like. And to me, the definition of a leader it's not just a woman who wears high heels like me today, <laughs> and trying to get used to it, but a leader is someone who reflects her community. And I think in the West, a lot of times when we bring women and we bring them here and they look like us and they speak our language and we're so excited, it's like, oh, look at this woman, she's so liberal. How did she ever come from Somalia or Afghanistan and really be so normal? Do you see what I mean? And that's so incorrect because a woman leader to me and my definition is someone who looks, uh, who, who, who behaves and talks and has the passion for a community. Because it's that woman they will relate to. It's that woman that will change them. So to me, this is a real leader of our country. <laughs> Number one. Number two, the issue of refugees is one that we are all concerned. We see, tongue, and, and it just breaks my heart because I have two boys. You see, People packed, you know, we talk about the slavery, we, the image we have and what we have read about the slavery was people packed at the bottom of, uh, of a ship on top of each other with chains. Today is a slavery, there is a slavery, but it's a different kind. When people leave, don't ever believe people left there. I, you know, I've been living in many countries in the States for a long time. I never took American passport, not because I love that country, because it's my second country but because I want to hold on. The last time I was in Somalia, it was a beautiful country. And, my, and when my parents sent me to the States, I was there to study. I don't know why I'm talking about this. I was supposed to speak to something, but anyway, I guess you have that trick. You say, speak from your heart and the things come. Okay. But when I was sent there, I was sent to go to school and come back to Somalia and live there. And I'm still waiting for it. And let's just say it was over 20 some years. I'm still waiting, holding on to. So everyone is not looking to come to Europe or to the States and to change and to love and to, not at all. I never had, it's only when I go to Somalia that I see, and, and I love and honor all the countries I lived in, but it's only that place that the food smells different, the tea is different, the looks is different, the passion is different, crying and sorrow is different because it's my country, you see? And, and I want to hold on to that. I, I was one of the few lucky ones, I have to be honest. I did not go through everything you went through. It's only when I go through um, uh, immigration. And you know, even though if a foreign ministry invited me or I'm seeing the president, it doesn't matter because I have a Somali passport, I have to be treated differently. <laughs> so uh, you would have to wait for my book. It's called Passport, Passport. <laughs> and I always make a point of if I have any time, I just would you know, stand somewhere and, and see who, I have 10 minutes, sorry. Okay, just uh, stop me. But um, I always make sure and I talk to the person I think who's being treated in any airport. I'm like, oh, so what's happening? Where are you from? Nigeria, where are you from? This, where are you? And of course, they're always young Muslim guys, you know. I'm like, okay, so what did you do? But the point is, um, so don't ever think, I want you when you see refugees or immigrants, look at them differently because once upon a time, those refugees that you see coming in Medusa, packed in a despicable 
live in despicable centers and coming in despicable uh, uh, boats or whatever it is. Those were people, they were somebody's daughters and husbands and children. Look at them differently, look at them differently. Once upon a time, she was a refugee going to Pakistan, packed in an old car. At that moment, she didn't know where she was going or where she was heading. She was somebody's daughter. All of these issues that you see, Syria, and try to personalize it, that would have been you, because all of those people, once upon a time, they had homes and neighbors and friends and sisters. They were somebody's uh, wives. They dressed beautifully and smelled great and ate great food once upon a time. Always keep that image when you see people being mistreated. Think about them. You know, it could be you. Um, so to me, again, this is, you know, this is what I would say for someone like that. The third thing I would like to add is she didn't get stuck. She moved on and went back to her country so that she can contribute. I just want you to know, never lose who you are. And you should always be a reflection of your own community. Don't ever take ideas that are alien to anybody. Just be yourself. And, and, and once you lose and detach yourself from your own community, then you really cannot make any difference. Not to, if you cannot make it to yourself, you can't make it to anybody else. So be who you are.